we're going to cover obviously the Okta project uh, and if you've been involved in the Okta project or aware, we've had a five-year plan. Um, so now what with the five-year plan? Um, so let's wind back the clock and uh, go to the very beginning. Um, five-year plan was developed by the members of the Okta project. Um, you know, the question was, how should the Okta project look like in five years? Oh, well, let's come up with a five-year plan then. Um, and so the focus, you know, was very much how can we ensure that the project has legs, has longevity, is sustainable? Um, how can we ensure that um, it's as secure as it can be? How do we make sure that um, we have a healthy community around the project uh, and keep that technology ticking along and getting all the new stuff in as possible. Um, three key aspects uh, to it. Um, as with many uh, open source projects that have been around for a while, there is a maintainer uh, gap aspect to things. So one of the focus areas was how do we minimize single point of failure with our current maintainers? How do we ensure that we have a healthy pipeline of people participating in the project, contributing to the project? Uh, again, uh, feeding into that whole sustainability aspect of the project. Uh, and looking at growing the membership of the project. Uh, we've done reasonably well. There's been some plenty of ups, a couple of downs, um, but uh, for the most part, you know, we want to grow uh, the project to be able to be self-sustaining. So it all kind of feeds together. Uh, and so moving forward, uh, you know, we, we identified the gaps. Uh, we went out to the community, got some uh, quotes, uh, and then identified, right, we need money. <laughs> um, Shocker. <laughs> I tried going out with the cap in hand. Eh, it didn't work so well. Tried a bit of dancing. Again, not so well. Uh, and so um, we decided that we were going to target membership growth and uh, kind of hive off new membership in 2023 to uh, fund our five-year plan. Okay, so thanks, Andy, for giving us an overview of how we got here. From the five-year plan conversations with members and the community, we focused on nine areas of improvement for the first part of the five-year plan. So um, it's been about a year now since we have started this forward momentum, so we'd like to kind of review what those areas of focus are, and then give an update on where we are with all of those. So these are the nine areas of focus that we were talking about. Um, and as Andy was mentioning about the alternative funding streams, right? We were actually approached by the Sovereign Tech Fund. And this was after we started developing our five-year plan. And they identified the Yocta project as a critical open source project. Um, and they wanted to help invest in some of the tooling to guarantee security and sustainability for the future. And this is because of all of the reasons that most likely you all have selected to use the Yocta project, right? It's flexibility, regardless of architecture. And it's used across almost every industry vertical in safety critical and non-safety critical applications. So um, there was a big interest in trying to invest so that we could see forward growth, work on security, and things like that. So when we were awarded the investment from the Sovereign Tech Fund, we were able to actually supply funding for eight out of the nine original areas of focus. And so we sent out the world's largest RFQ and um, away we went in trying to find the right experts in the industry to help us be able to work on all of these different tools. So Patch Chess was one of them. 
If you are, if you were in the mini summit yesterday, you heard a great update from Bay Libre on all of the work that they did with patch tests. So I won't go into it too um, deeply, but uh, long story short, um, patchwork needed to get updated. The updates broke patch test and therefore um, kind of left it broken for a pretty long time. And when you work off email patch submission, this is this is not great. So um, big thank you to Bailey Bray for coming in and, and supporting this work. Um, and now it's no longer broken. Um, Trevor's presentation will be on our YouTube and he goes really far in depth on all of the specific aspects. So I would highly encourage you to visit the Yocto Project YouTube in about a week and check out his presentation. One of the other areas was toaster. Um, in my mind, I visualize it as this really adorable toaster, but I think a lot of people who previously used it would say, um, no, it's not so cute. Um, it really, really, really needed some tending to. Um, you know, it's a, a web-based UI, kind of a GUI, and um, it really needed some work. So Savoy Fairy Linux came in and did a lot of updates to toaster, as you can see here, enabling it to work with the current code base. It's kind of a baseline, right? But, but it really needed to be done. Um, and so um, Mohammed Raza from Savoy Fair Linux gave a presentation on Toaster specifically yesterday, um, including all of the updates that are included in Scarf Gap coming out later this month. So again, I would encourage you to go out and watch Mohammed's presentation on the specifics for, for Toaster. So core workflow improvements. Um, we had the help with uh, Lingua Lin Linutronics? Linutronics. Linutronics. There's just some words. Um, and so the goals with this were to reduce frustration, reduce build times, and just simplify the core workflow as a whole. Um, that has been completed and should be out in Scarth Gap later this month. Again, project tooling, um, Bay Libre took this one for us as well, and it was covered in the presentation yesterday. Um, but a lot of these tools to automate common developer tasks just really, really needed to be updated. The maintainers for those tools had moved on to something else or started working on, on you know, another tool. And while these tools were helpful, they weren't as helpful as they could be with the newer versions of Yocto. So um, dev tool got improved support, recipe tool got improved support. Um, and all of the backlogged features and features and bugs um, were cleared, which is super awesome. So thank you to Bailey Bray for making that possible. All right, so another one was Meta Open Embedded, and this was headed up by um, Consolco Group. And essentially, we wanted to improve testing and formalize processes. So um, CVE checking got added, um, patch test uh, checks can be enabled per layer, and we instituted a deprecation policy for layers and re reproducibility reports, which will be super important once the CRA becomes an official thing. So thank you to Consolco for taking that work on. Well, security, you can tell, was a point of focus because the things that were done exceeded the, <laughs> the bucket container that we had for it on the right-hand side. But security was one of the main focuses of Sovereign Tech Fund's um, you know, initiative in investing in Yocto Project. Um, they really wanted to see a dedicated team for security, formalized processes, and you know, as we know in the last few versions of Yocto Project, SBOM generation has been included, but it was not automatically enabled. You had to manually enable it. Now it will be automatically enabled, so all of your legal and compliance teams can rejoice in <laughs> um, your beautiful SBOM manifestation um, created uh, automatically for you. And um, as part of this work, uh, SPDX 3.0 was uh, POC'd, so once that's ready to go, we should have that uh, available and running as well. Yeah, and huge thanks to Marta for uh, a lot yeah. of the security work. Absolutely. Um, and we're getting to the end here. So we've got the VS Code IDE. Subway Fair took this one as well. Um, we debuted this at Embedded World last week. If you were there um, or if you heard about it or saw something on LinkedIn, um, this is a plugin now, uh, directly available, super simple, super easy to run, and it connects to a variety of IDEs. Um, Mohammed, the same um, person who worked on Toaster, also took this body of work as well. And he went into explicit detail on how to actually run this um, in his presentation yesterday. 
They're also at the Yakja Project booth in the sponsor showcase. Um, Mohammed's there and is happy to answer any questions. There's a QR code that'll take you directly to the documentation for that. Um, yeah, for the cool kids, as they say. Uh, we've got the binary distro that Bootland's taking on, and um, this one is still a work in progress. It was a huge body of work to take on, so um, big, big thank you to Bootland for being able to, to, to push this out, and we do anticipate it in the next few months being, being available. And then lastly, we've got layer setup, um, also taken on by Linutronics. <laughs> and this is our last work in progress. So um, as you can see, just over the last year, there's just been an incredible amount of work taken on by both the, the leadership team at Yakta Project, the developers in the community, and all of the consultancies assisting us with, with this RFQ. So thank you to everyone, because it would not be possible without your feedback or your contribution. Right, so that's kind of five-year plan uh, side of things. What next, right? Um, so one of the things that we want to see moving forward is how Yocto Project can actually expand what it can do, right? Um, there are multiple areas where we work really, really well. Some areas, eh, not so well. So how can we expand the capabilities of what the Yocto Project can do? One of those is from the OS perspective. Why do we just do Linux, right? Linux is great, don't get me wrong. What about others, you know? Lots of cute OSs out there. FreeBSD is one, um, OpenBSD, NetBSD, whatever, right? You know, Yocta Project can build for whatever you want it to fit. But sometimes you kind of need to actually choose the right software stack to meet that. And FreeBSD has got some advantages. Um, there are some companies out there that are very GPL averse, right? Regardless whether it's GPL v2 or v3, they just do not like those three letters together. So FreeBSD is an alternative platform that would allow them to continue using their current workflow, but not have to worry about some of those license issues. We want more architecture support, right? There's lots of up and coming pieces of hardware. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I work for ARM and I think we're the best architecture. However, with my chairmanship hat on, there's lots of space in the ecosystem. So we'd love to have RISC V supported. We'd love to have Open Power supported. Um, we were hoping to have had RISC V support for Scarf Gap. However, not enough members stood up to help fund that work. Uh, you know, adding architecture support does increase cost to the project substantially, both from a manpower system, uh, you know, from an auto builder perspective, etc. So, it does require some funding. So, hopefully, we can actually engage more of the membership to participate in that. Um, it is 2024 after all. Surely Yocta Project should be doing something around AI. Um, everyone else is, so why aren't we? Um, <laughs> so we need to look at what can be done from an AI perspective. Is it that Yocto is what's used to build the reference platforms for a number of AI uh, solutions, whether it be leveraging things like UXL from an accelerator perspective, whether it's making sure that BSPs for platforms that have NPUs, GPUs, uh, et cetera, uh, work as well as possible. So the areas that we need to look at. Um, and we kind of want, actually we need more mm -hmm. people to step up and take on chunks of maintainership. Um, Richard Purdy, our current uh, project architect, has a huge amount on his shoulders, right? Uh, and a big concern to the community is the bus factor, right? Um, we want to alleviate that 
we want to make sure that the load is spread. So if you are so inclined, please do step up. Um, you will be showered with love and adoration. Uh, I can't promise any you know, greenbacks or whatever your preferred uh, monetary item is. However, um, there's a lot of fun to be had. Um, there's no pain, I promise, ish. Well, and just to touch on this some more, I mean, when you look at, you know, um, the tooling and the gap that we had to cover with this funding, right? I mean, this was from years of, of technical debt stacking up, essentially increasing developer frustration, which decreases the opportunity for contributorship and feature improvements because you're so worried that you're, you know, you've got to work on bugs and, and things that are more critical. So these tools are really important. The community tells us they're really important. We need someone to maintain them sooner than later so that we don't have that technical gap building up again. We worked so hard to close that gap and it would just you know, be a shame to see all of that start piling back up. Um, everything's working now. Cleared backlogs, let's keep it that way. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I mean, and there's uh, an initiative being kicked off uh, to identify um, and clearly identify the specific roles within the leadership group to help alleviate some of uh, the burden on uh, the architects uh, and the uh, technical folk that are able to step up. So it will be a lot of fun, I promise. <laughs> um, and it will, you know, th there's a lot of scope for growth. We would love to have some form of um, kind of internship if that's feasible at some point. Uh, there's lots of ideas that are kicking around of how can we grow uh, the technical capability of the community uh, and members at the same time. Uh, because at the end of the day, we want to give back a little bit to our members as much as they give to us. Um, so how can you get involved? Um, you know, what's the project going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, right? Um, more contributors are needed, right? Look at bugs. There's lots of low-hanging fruit that people can start getting their hands dirty on and get some practice on. Um, try a lot of the new tooling that we've just spent the last 12, 18 months um, developing for the community, right? Um, give us that feedback. Let us know what works, what doesn't work. If you find an area where you could uh, improve it, have at it. Um, and again, if your company's not a member of the Octo project, tell them they should be, right? Um, if you know you think actually we benefit a huge amount from this open source project, we need to give a little bit back. Um, there's lots of ways that we can do it. Uh, reach out to uh, myself, Megan, uh, or uh, Randy Armour from the Linux Foundation, uh, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, we would love to see more people participate, both from a monetary perspective, but crucially from a hands-on keyboard perspective. Yes, so we've got a BOF uh, happening Thursday, which I believe is tomorrow. Yeah. Perfect. Tomorrow, in the afternoon, led by Philip Ballister, sitting in the back modestly, um, we had some really great discussion at the mini summit yesterday, uh, especially around the aerospace and safety critical fireside chat that was going. So um, we're going to try and roll some of that discussion over into the BOF, um, but always come with your ideas, come with your opinions. Um, it's usually a spicy session. I am filling in for Josef Holtzmeier, so I, I have promised that I will bring chocolate. Um, I will not throw as well as he does, but I will, okay, perfect. Tim has taken this, taken this on, um, and I might try and smuggle in a bottle of whiskey, but you know, um, you didn't hear that recording. Um, we love to have you tomorrow. Please, please come to the BOF. Um, we'd love to hear your ideas and questions. One correction, Smiles is in that open embedded R2 work. Oh, thank you so much for that, Tim. Apologies to Smile. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Indeed, thank you. So uh, we have some time for questions, if there are any, or comments. Uh, I will take donations if you wish to put your hands in your pocket. 
Any questions? Shout, I'll repeat. Yeah, just for, for those that didn't quite hear and for the recording, um, Paul's saying that what we've just shown proves that uh, far from you know, the, these comments that uh, the Opt project's done, dusted, there's nothing, there's no growth, there's no need for anything else. Uh, far from it, there is lots to do. Um, we've done lots and we've got a whole lot more to do uh, on top of that. Um, you know, there's always room for growth, room for improvement. Uh, and, you know, with your help, uh, we hope to be able to deliver on that growth and improvement uh, for your benefit. Yes, and as things like the CRA come up, there's different expectations coming from, um, you know, government and regulatory authorities um, it, with regards to um, software supply chain and things like that. So, um, you know, even if someone could say the project is complete, there's still changes in the regulatory, compliance, legal, et cetera, environments that we need to be adaptable for. Um, I just met someone at Embedded World last week that told me that they were manually creating S-bombs because they couldn't get their client to upgrade from Sumo. So when I told him that it was automatically enabled and automatically generated and most likely error-free, um, he was ecstatic. And again, that provided him some talking points to put pressure on his client to try and move forward with some of these updates. So um, yeah. Many angles to work on that. So going back to the, you know, we're not done, right? Um, there's a lot of new things that we as core developers would love to be doing. But as a consultant, I am being paid most of the time to uplift someone from some very, very ancient thing to some slightly newer thing. So that means all of my t paid time and what is making Quinsulco profitable, right, is me working in the past. So anything that you're seeing me doing that's moving us forward, adding maturin support that let us do Python and Rust together, this type of stuff, right? So any one of the core developers will give you the exact same storyline. The only person that's actually paid to do the forward future work is Richard Purdy. Most of the rest of this work is not being funded. And so the industry has got to figure out a way to change so that the future is sustainable. We don't want to fall back into this mm -hmm. technical debt situation that we had. We have to figure out a way that that's what we prioritize. So all of us continue to move into the future in the open, secure, safe, and profitable. Thank you, Tim. All well set. Any other questions or comments? Desires? Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, thank you for your contribution and for that presentation. Um, I only was a little bit surprised that you haven't added BSP maintaining as one of your most concerns parts mm. to the list as well. Yeah, um, it, it's difficult to actually uh, ensure BSPs are maintained by the respective vendors. Mm -hmm. um, we do our best to try and encourage them to ensure that they're updated, um, but it's really at their will. Um, we do have Yocto compatible from a layer perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that 
everything is maintained, is up to date, and it's all modern, etc. Um, there has been discussions in the past around how do we do this from a BSP perspective? Is there some sort of, uh, you know, gold star standard that we can do or, or something along those lines? Um, but it's, it's not um, the easiest thing to manage and actually implement. Um, some people really don't care, right? Well, you've got some software, it works. Yeah, it worked for five minutes. Progress has moved on and you're stuck in the past. And kind of to Tim's point, this is where a lot of the consultants come in and end up doing the heavy lifting of moving it or dragging it forward slightly, right? So I don't think, uh, you know, Tim and, and others will have customers wanting to upgrade to Scarthgap for another two years or so, right? Uh, we've already moved on. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a valid comment, valid point, uh, but it's a really difficult one to actually see through, but we will do our best. And, you know, as a community, we can all apply pressure to those vendors that mm -hmm. are lacking somewhat, um, and hopefully they'll get the message and reach out for some help. And on the vendor uh, maintained layers as well, we did hear a lot of community feedback with specific frustration in some vendor layers that aren't being updated at what their clients are perceiving as the appropriate speed. And they come to us saying, you know, why isn't this working? Can you help? And we can help direct and facilitate conversations to those vendors. And I found out that, for example, one of them is doing a complete overhaul. They're aware that that gap exists, but they haven't sent any messaging to the community at all that all these bugs are popping up and that they're actually paying attention to it, right? So I think some of it is also uh, related to communication and just directing questions to the right place and putting that pressure on for change. Philip. Um, with respect to BSPs, the talk that was in this room before was from uh, AMD and they were saying very, very positive things about their BSPs. And I know myself and some others in the room have been long suffering uh, AMD customers. And the things we heard in the talk, I think are a result of a number of us speaking to people at AMD about our concerns with their exactly. process. And they have made changes and we're hearing really good things now. Exactly. You you never know that it, most likely if you're experiencing some sort of trouble, it's not just you. Um, and putting those questions out to the community in whatever fashion, whether it's on a mailing list or an IRC, usually will give people the confidence to say, oh yeah, I've experienced that too. And with enough voices, then, you know, it's easy to put, put pressure. So, yeah. Hey, Bill. Bill. Not that you need a mic, but. <laughs> so I, I know it's not universally true, but in many cases, the best BSP is no BSP. Um, and that's why we're doing generic ARM64. Um, if the kernel, upstream kernel works, the def configs are all upstream or you know easily overwritable, that solves a lot of this problem. You still have the boot firmware to figure out, um, but you know, one of the problems I always tell people when using the Yocto project is Yocto project gives you a lot of rope and you can get yourself into trouble by having that rope. If <clears throat> what we really need to do is encourage the vendors to make things work upstream and eliminate many of the need for the vendor um, the meta layers. Um, and that, that's not going to solve all the problems. There's always going to be some need for the meta layers. But, you know, if you have the basic functionality that you need with just pure Pocky and the p other supporting layers that aren't vendor layers, um, then, then you're going to be in a lot better position for, for maintenance. It's going to be a lot easier to move from Yocto project version to project version. So, you know, the, the system ready, the ARM system ready uh, standard and generic ARM64 hopefully can move, push at least the ARM part of this ecosystem towards that. And that's not gonna be enough for everybody, but it's going to make things better when you are using a vendor layer. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, there, there are, as you say, going to be some cases where we're just not going to get away from it, uh, whether it's because somebody's got some newfangled doohickey in their platform or what, but um, yeah, absolutely just using the bare minimum uh, is probably the best route. In a perfect world, what kind of commitment would you like to see from contributors and maintainers? So we hear a lot about people being overwhelmed, so it seems doubly inter doubly scary because do I want to get involved in something that everybody is kind of feeling this way? So I think the 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 biggest um, issue is from a reliability perspective. So if you're going to, and, and we can't expect everyone, but what we would like is have that reliability aspect of, okay, so you, you're doing patches and you're quite open and upfront that, look, I can only spend maybe an hour a week or something along those lines on doing whatever work you're doing. Um, if you come along to like the bug triage and, and whatever else and you say, okay, I'm going to tackle that bug and I'll take that on, I'll own that bug, whatever. Having some form of communication back to the rest of the bug triage team of, okay, here's an update, you know, or whatever else. What we tend to find quite often is that unfortunately people go radio silent and we have no idea what's going on. We don't see any code. We don't see any emails. There's no RC comms or anything like that, right? Um, that's the big pain point, and that's what adds to a lot of the stress. And we don't hear anything, don't see anything. So, Richard or you know the the handful of people that we do have working very regularly on things end up taking it onto their plate and, and whatnot. Um, you know, we have at Arm, we have. One person that is predominantly dedicated to upstream Yocto. Um, we have a large team of people that work on Yocto internally, uh, but externally facing, it's between one and two people. Um, and I, I understand companies have to balance their business requirements, um, but just remember, without you know, if you're using Yocto in your product sets, etc. If there is no Yocto, you have no product, right? Uh, so it's trying to find that happy medium. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you're interested in participating, interesting, interested in contributing and doing some work, reach out, have a discussion of, look, what is it that you think is feasible for somebody that can do one hour a week or something along those lines, right? Let's have that conversation. We know where everyone stands then, uh, and it's a nice, happy relationship rather than one fraught with, uh, where the heck have you been? You said this, and you've gone there, and it, everyone's yeah. blood starts to boil a little bit. Yeah, and I do think the other issue that we've run into on this side of things is that people will say, oh, yeah, I'm interested. Then we spend a lot of time onboarding someone. As you've mentioned, it's a little bit complex. So you spend all the onboarding time and then that person decides, okay, I'm not interested in doing that anymore. And they just kind of fall off. So it's difficult to keep the time investment of onboarding when you know, people start dropping off. However, we want to deal with the overwhelm, right? Just as much as we revamp the contributor guide and you know, are doing a lot of work on documentation and trying to consolidate things and simplify steps and processes, et cetera, like, Please, you know, if people are saying they're overwhelmed with that, like we would love to hear their feedback on if there are parts of the maintainership process that should be evaluated. Are we not sil siloing things properly? Is there a workflow, you know, process problem that we could work on? Um, and the only way that we know that is if, you know, we receive that feedback and kind of work through those problems together. Yeah, and talking about feedback. So if you have an hour a week, okay, if you literally just went and picked one of the mailing lists, right? Maybe you really care about Python. Maybe you really care about Perl, whatever it is, right? So pick one of those mailing lists, look at the layers that you care about or that you have domain knowledge on or whatever, right? Please go and review the patches coming in. 
if you think that I am personally able to review 50 to 70 to 100 patches in MetaPython every week, you're dreaming. I do not have the time. So what are you seeing? You see patches come in, you see them get merged, right? Thankfully, we have Kim who's actually continuing to keep that stuff merging. And it is tested on the auto builder and some stuff like this, right? So that's the first thing I would ask. Help us review patches. Help us make sure that every patch coming in has had eyeballs on it, okay? The second thing, if you've got maybe slightly more time, maybe an hour is enough, right? But pick a recipe, enable p-test, okay? As soon as the p-test is enabled, it's way easier to do now. If you have any questions about why it's easier, just ask me. Uh, if you, as soon as we have that enabled, that means that can run in automation. That runs in CI. Now we have, have that data being stored forever. And now we have that ability to actually maybe start wrapping that into the new SBOM formats. And we start actually having you know, a safety critical uh, SBOM report being generated by the Octa project. We're not there yet, but we could be there. You know, Kate, Kate talked about that yesterday. So um, these are a couple of really, really low hanging fruit, easy light touch areas that we could use help in. There's plenty of others, but that's my first two suggestions. Thanks, Tim. Okay, I think we might have time for one more. So one of the things that we're doing in our company and the projects I work on is we try and the latest projects, we're running off a of master constantly. So when upstream folks are changing recipes, we get that stuff immediately. If it breaks stuff, we figure out how to fix it. And I encourage my team to not work around it in our own stuff, but try and contribute patches and comments back upstream. Um, so that's kind of the minimal contributions that we make. But the people on my team that complain about those um, one-off breakages every couple of weeks, they didn't have to suffer through the transition from Daisy to Thud um, years ago, and we're still on that product, stuck on Thud. So it's helping us out quite a bit and trying to help the community back. Yeah, no thanks, and absolutely every little helps. Um, and there's lots more that can be done, and hopefully we can do it, right? Um, and finding ways that is easy for your companies, easy for you as an, an individual, as a developer. Um, let's see how we can get there and, and move forward. You know, incremental steps. You know, it's a crawl, walk, run scenario, um, and, and we appreciate it's going to take a bit of time. So hopefully, uh, you know, with your help, we can actually get there. So. Yeah, and as, as a consultant, you know, just directly to your point, as a consultant, I'm now under, you know, NDA seeing people's code behind the curtain, right? So what do I see? I see a whole lot of BB appends. What are they fixing? Something very, very generic, 90% of the time. It should have been upstreamed. Hmm. And in fact, that means several of you are all carrying that same change, but it was never upstreamed. So yes, you've got specific needs, we're always gonna focus on your own specific needs. Even the Octa Project is still gonna focus on your own needs to try to make sure you're happy. But we need to be getting that stuff upstreamed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. Thanks everyone for participating. And if you have any other questions or this spurred some thought, please come to the BOF tomorrow. We would love to see everybody there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.